As fun as it is to get lost in the nitty-gritty technical details of what makes a piece of music work, the strength of a piece of music is decided not just by these details, but also by the overarching direction of the work. Where is the climax of the piece? When and how should the music build intensity, and when is it time to bring it down? How do you map out an arrangement so that the audience isn't getting bored, or too overstimulated, or losing the main thread of the composition? Being able to answer these broader questions allows a piece of music to tell a story, to keep a listener following and engaged for 10, 20 minutes, or even an hour or more. It's actually very similar to designing a video game in this way. The ending sequence for Tears of the Kingdom plays out to be about an hour and takes you on a fantastic roller coaster ride from an ominous start to a hugely satisfying finish. The music is not only expertly composed to be the perfect accompaniment to the sequence, but also does a wonderful job at budgeting intensity, managing a continuous gradual crescendo from the start up until the final climactic moments. You can't have a big, satisfying moment without creating anticipation to build up to it, but the more anticipation you build, the harder it is to create a payoff big enough to make it feel justified. Tears of the Kingdom builds up an insane amount of anticipation and manages to pay it off brilliantly. I want to take a look at the ending sequence and see how the music contributes to that built-up anticipation, and how it manages to ride that wave of intensity over the course of an hour without losing emotional potency. And if you couldn't tell from that description, this video will be chock full of spoilers for the ending of the game. And I gotta say, this is a game with one hell of an ending, so if you haven't beaten it yet, until you do, Go ahead, save this video to your watch later, and subscribe to the channel, of course, while you're there, and, and donate to my Patreon, and then also just send me a little compliment. When you finally make it to Ganondorf's lair, and you watch him transform from the Crypt Keeper into the young, burly form that you'll be fighting, the music that accompanies his reveal is broken up into three short segments. One that starts low and builds intensity up, then the climactic big reveal moment where the intensity is at a peak, and then a third statement that brings the intensity back down to a simmer and gives us another crescendo to bring us into the actual final battle. To analyze how this works, I have five general aspects of music that determine a piece's level of intensity. These aspects are Dynamic The most obvious one, loud is more intense than quiet. But more importantly than that, a change in dynamic can generate or release a lot of intensity. This big swelling crescendo as Ganondorf transforms into buff mode obviously generates intensity, but so does the sudden drop to a quieter dynamic that follows. Speed. This is another obvious, primal effect, but the faster a piece of music goes, the more intense it feels. This particular aspect is not contributing much intensity to this music specifically, but I'm sure you understand how speed works without much explanation. Range. Notes in the middle range feel comfortable, while notes in the very low or very high ranges sound more intense. This breakdown to a unison line in the low strings and bass voices features low instruments in a fairly low range, lending an ominous air to the music. Contributing to this feeling, too, is the dissonance. The less pleasing something sounds to the ear, the more intense it feels. You can't spell intensity without tension, after all. The jagged intervals of this line defy characterization into any clear key or chord, featuring semitone and tritone leaps that capture the dread of facing off against this brutal warrior. The crescendo that follows shows off different ways to use dissonance, like crunchy voicings and chromatically wandering harmony, which plays into... Complexity. The more notes are in a chord, the more separate parts there are layered on top of each other, the more intricate or unusual the form, the more intense a piece is going to sound. If we think of the opposite of tension as relaxation, then it makes sense that anything that makes you think harder about the music you're listening to is going to make it feel more intense. 
The way the strings weave their way through this richly voiced progression, individual voices coming in one after the other and moving independently of one another gradually moves the complexity up as we crescendo towards the big reveal. This big reveal, blaring out Ganondorf's theme, uses a huge, majestic orchestration with brass and choir belting out their chords, and this fits brilliantly with the dissonance and coldness of the chromatically shifting fourth intervals that define Ganondorf's sound, adding together to perfectly capture the aura of a demon king. To make this moment feel like the peak of intensity, the range and dynamic are cranked pretty much to their max, and the level of dissonance is certainly nothing to sneeze at, with these chromatically shifting fourths clashing against the C bass pedal underneath. Now, there are certain techniques of music and sound that seem to work universally. Any kind of crescendo, getting louder and louder, builds up anticipation. The audience has to expect something coming at the end of the crescendo because music can't just keep getting louder indefinitely. So if you take that energy and crescendo into a big fat pause, this brings that anticipation to a head. It sucks all the air out of the room. It makes the listener hold their breath for what's about to come. And the proper resolution of this, what the listener wants to hear next, is a great big boom, a huge crashing chord to release this anticipation, this tension, but that's not what we get after the final build-up into the start of the fight. Pounding C bass notes play underneath strings and brass, moving up the C Locrian scale, each note harmonized with this sus2 voicing. This voicing is an inversion of a stack of perfect fourths, a key component of the sound of Ganondorf's theme, and planing this shape chromatically to follow a C Locrian scale provides this great dark edge. The crescendo builds up to a head and then stops short, leaving us holding our breath on the edge of our seat before the fight begins. This moves into a loading screen which is genius, using the necessity to load the next part of the game to enhance the music rather than detract from it, leaving us at the peak of anticipation for a painfully long time. When the fight starts and the music comes back in, we don't get that big explosive release that we wanted. Instead, a low bass drone washes over us, accompanied only by the atmospheric howling of the wind and the odd choral sigh. Bringing the musical intensity down to a low point here is a shrewd compositional move to keep the long-term structure of the battle engaging. Any performing musician knows that you can't start off a piece with too much energy if the plan is to build it up to a climax farther in. If you blow your whole load of uh, mute skewers too early, you won't have any in the tank for later when you need it. You've got to pace yourself. The only category of intensity in play here really is range with the bass drone sounding low enough to generate an appropriately ominous soundscape. The second phase of the fight sees a move away from the atmospheric to more typical boss battle music, adapting the Ganondorf battle theme from Ocarina of Time. The threatening flat 3, flat 2 to 1 movement from that original theme is altered from its 2316 time signature origins to a slightly less ridiculous 238 time signature. The odd time signature on its own contributes a level of complexity that ups the intensity of the arrangement. Dynamic, 
range, speed, complexity, dissonance, this section is firing on all cylinders. But you can see there's still room to grow in each of these areas before the fight is finished. This fight is full of great moments too. As all of these clones of Ganondorf pop up, the music switches to chromatically descending forths to emphasize your anxiety. But just as you've resigned yourself to having your butt cleaved in half, the sages bust in to save you, bringing in a melodic, tonal section of music that releases some of the pressure built up by the chaos of the music preceding it. By itself, this sage's music feels pretty somber, but having it use actual triadic chords and stay within a key makes it sound like a huge relief compared to what was building up to it. The third phase of the fight sees Ganondorf dispose of his clones and your sages to resume your one-on-one -on -one duel. The music maintains a lot of the ideas from the second phase, but just turns up the intensity in every category. A new, low-string bassline comes in with this winding chromatic figure, defying any sort of tonal categorization but centering around an A note. The upper strings, with this driving 16th note figure that was acting as the bassline for part of the second phase music, is outlining a C minor sound. Combined, these two parts create an A diminished sort of tonality, but the two both clash in really dissonant ways. Played so fast in such a low register, the details of each part gets lost, and they add up to an almost unintelligible wall of sound that feels absolutely oppressive. Pushing each category of intensity up here helps the music fit the rising excitement of the sword duel as you feel yourself getting closer and closer to victory. But after you strike down the Demon King, the battle shifts into a new gear altogether. Ganondorf transforms into an enormous dragon and bursts out of the depths to do battle in the skies above Hyrule. In this phase, the music shifts goals slightly. During the duel with Ganondorf, the music was slowly increasing the intensity the further along you got into the fight, using pretty straightforward methods of low, loud, fast, dissonant figures. The goal of this part of the music was to create a sense of dread, to make you feel how opposing your enemy was and get the sense that there's no way you could win. Against Dragondorf, however, the music adopts a more emotional intensity. See, there's no point to tension without payoff, otherwise music would just be an exercise in stressing ourselves out. We do get a sense of release here by the music abandoning the chromatic dissonance and wild time signatures, but the overall intensity is maintained through the use of references to themes that we are familiar with. Think of how engaging it is when a game brings you back to an area that you've been to previously, but in a new way or in a different form. The return makes you reflect on all the time that's passed since you were last in this place. How much has changed about you or the environment between then and now, and what that means. The dragon battle music immediately uses this technique to crank up the emotional intensity by blaring the first three notes of Zelda's lullaby in the horns as her dragon mode self swoops in to join you in your battle. In fact, every single melody in this battle theme is a reference to a different piece of music. We have Zelda's lullaby and Ganondorf's themes woven in there, of course, but even this slower, grandiose melody played by the Chinese Erhu and harmonized with French horn is a slowed down version of the Tears of the Kingdom main theme. Whittle down the dragon's health enough, and the music moves to a sax led section taken from the game's main theme, with the horns bringing in a slowed down Zelda's lullaby as a counterline underneath.
This section is driving the emotional intensity as hard as it can, with the full power of the orchestra put into blasting this heroic theme in a big, triumphant display. This section is much shorter and more repetitive than the main dragon fight theme as well, which offers the music an easy off-ramp to dynamically shift when it's time to score the final blow. Finishing off the dragon's health bar brings the music back down to a solo piano figure, a big heavy power chord in the lowest register, while these high notes rain down in perfect fifth intervals over top. Stripping away the orchestra like this definitely brings down the intensity, but this is to facilitate another huge buildup and we can see that the piano here is doing a great job of keeping the intensity up on its own. The range used is huge! The harmony is complex, spelling out a full B major 13 chord. It's played at a strong dynamic, and the move to a B diminished chord under this continued perfect fifth line brings in a potent level of dissonance as the cellos bring in the main theme underneath. As Link draws his sword to deliver the final blow, the music builds up again. We need peak intensity here, but it still has to sound triumphant. The music accomplishes this by going all in on the complexity, with a bunch of different layers coming together to overwhelm you. Rich F sharp over B piano chords play a 4 over 3 polyrhythm underneath the straight 4 4 time melody, a soaring figure that gets passed between the sax and the oboe. High string pads and busy piano and wind ostinatos swelling as you plunge the master sword into the dragon's head. After this enormous buildup, the music releases, a cymbal swell leading into this one last held F sharp over B chord and then we get to watch a dragon explode. Why does he explode? That part really took me out of the ending. After this, the music completely drops out. The coast is clear. We've really done it. We've really defeated Ganondorf. This is where I assumed the game was going to end, and I was more than satisfied with what I had just played. But we get one last huge crescendo into the biggest climax of the game. After the cutscene where you turn Zelda back into a human, we find ourselves falling through the sky once again. Now, for the final payoff. Everything that you've achieved through the game so far is going to come to a head here as you dive through the sky to try and catch Zelda and redeem yourself for that missed catch that opened your adventure. The game's main theme kicks down your door and starts blasting in all of its heroic glory, a completely cathartic soundtrack to this final drop. The music is arranged to dynamically shift to new sections the closer you get to the princess, moving from the main theme to a key change up a step adding in Zelda's lullaby as a counterline. then right at the last stretch shifting again to blast the original Zelda theme as you reach out your hand to make the catch. This is the ultimate callback emotional release. This theme has been used very sparingly throughout the game and it feels so good being treated to it as you save the princess. The pounding triplet chords underneath dynamically jump to their loudest climactic stabs as you snatch her hand and the screen fades to white. Oh, 
this is one of the best endings to a video game I think I've ever played! It is such a treat to get taken on a ride like this by developers who know exactly what they're doing, and it feels even more special and meaningful after dozens of hours of being left to your own devices. The more anticipation that gets built up, the harder it is to deliver a satisfying conclusion, and after such a long and open game, I didn't think it was possible to tie it all up in such a perfect finale. But Tears of the Kingdom did it, man. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did and you want to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon. I gotta say a big thank you to patrons Mr. Q and Nick Shadell for requesting I cover the ending of this game. It was a very difficult but very fun process making this video. Anyways, happy travels. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.